Hi everyone, and thank you for coming today. Uh, today we've got Walter Block here talking about uh, property rights and pollution. Now it's a topic that we're all familiar with because it's one of the most common objections to libertarianism. You know, how can liberty help the environment? How can free markets take care of the externalities of pollution? Now, thankfully, Walter Block has done a lot of work on this. He needs no introduction, but as most of you probably know, you know, he's an Austrian school economist and an anarcho-libertarian philosopher, and he's professor of economics at Loyola University of New Orleans, and he's a senior fellow with the Ludwig von Mises Institute. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Walter Block. Well, thank you for the introduction, Matt, and I'm looking forward to having a good uh, conversation with people. Uh, let me begin with a, uh, I won't say a fairy tale, but actually a matter of history. Um, in the 1830s and 1840s in the U.S., there would be uh, what we would now call uh, pollution cases. Uh, in those days, they uh, uh, they didn't call it that. I forget exactly what they called it, but the typical um, a nuisance. They called it nuisance uh, cases. And the uh, typical um, situation would be there'd be some little old lady who would uh, go out and um, hang up her washing on the line. They didn't have uh, clothes dryers in those days. Uh, there'd be a clothes line and uh, uh, pins that you'd, uh, uh, clothes pins that you'd put your clothes on the line. And uh, she'd uh, put them out there and they'd be uh, wet and uh, clean. And she'd come back two hours later and she wanted them to be dry, and they were dry, but they were dirty. So she'd go to court and say that their factory over there, um, in effect, polluted me or uh, uh, trespassed dust particles onto my clean, wet laundry. And when I came back, it was uh, dry but dirty. And I want two things out of that um, rascally, uh, not rascally rabbit, but a rascally <laughs> Uh, factory, I want an injunction, namely, uh, and damages. I want an injunction, which means a letter from the judge saying, you know, bad, bad boys, do that again, and I'll put you in jail. And, uh, you know, an injunction, uh, cease and desist, stop polluting this lady's uh, laundry. And I want damages also, you know, it cost me, I had to wash the laundry again, whatever. So that was one kind of case. Another case uh, would be a farmer would... Uh, have some haystacks and there'd be a, a, a train and the train would come by and it would set off sparks 300 feet in the air and it would uh, set on fire the uh, farmer's uh, haystack and the farmer would go to court and say uh, that choo-choo train um, uh, violated my property rights it um, it uh, set my haystacks on fire with its sparks and um, I'd like damages and an injunction and um, these were the sorts of law cases that occurred in the 1840s, 1850s, 1830s. Uh, my um, sources for this is a book by Horowitz, uh, not our Stephen Horowitz, a different Horowitz, a guy from Harvard, and also Murray Rothbard, who wrote an excellent, excellent article uh, on air pollution in the Cato Journal in 1982. Now, did these plaintiffs always win? No, they didn't always win. Uh, <clears throat> you had to prove uh, damages. You had to prove that uh, it was that railroad that did it. You had to prove that it was that factory that did it. But the courts were open to this. Uh, they didn't dismiss the uh, lawsuit out of hand. They didn't say, well, what are you, crazy? You can't bring a lawsuit against somebody for trespassing dust particles onto you. Uh, so uh, these lawsuits sometimes succeeded, sometimes failed. And the fact that they could sometimes succeed had several positive effects. One effect was the um, uh, factory and the railroad were led by Adam Smith's invisible hand. Namely, if they didn't behave, they would uh, get uh, lawsuits against them. Uh, plaintiffs would come charging at them. Uh, the invisible hand would lead them to what? to uh, put meshes in their smokestacks, in their chimneys, to capture um, the uh, dust particles before they could get out of the chimney. Did it have to be perfect? No, it didn't have to be perfect. But if you catch, uh, oh, 80, 90 percent uh, of the uh, pollutants, then um, uh, maybe the little old lady wouldn't complain. And also, if there were just a little smudge on her um, uh, laundry, then... Um, 
you know, the, there is this thing in law called de minimis, which means the law doesn't take into account trifles. I mean, we all exhale and, you know, exhaling uh, has, I'm not sure what, I think carbon dioxide or something bad. And, uh, you know, we, we don't sue each other over exhaling. Uh, because it's de minimis. And also we've sort of homesteaded the right to exhale. Our forefathers did that, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so that was one benefit. And uh, not only would the, um, uh, the, the factory put uh, screens in its chimneys to capture some of the dust particles, and if they captured, oh, 80, 90, 95%, that, that was good. Uh, but the railroad also would uh, put in uh, smoke, uh, uh, spark capturing devices or smoke prevention devices or whatever it was. Uh, similar, they'd put some sort of mesh there, and instead of the sparks going 300 feet, the sparks would go 20 or 30 feet, and it wouldn't be so bad. And, and if one spark hit one haystack, the court might say, well, you know, what the heck. Uh, uh, so uh, was this a perfect solution? No, it wasn't perfect, but it was, you know, pretty good. And there were other uh, benefits. Another benefit was, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, they, they would be led, again, as if by an invisible hand, to use uh, clean burning anthracite coal instead of dirty burning sulfur coal. The anthracite coal is more expensive. The uh, sulfur coal was cheaper, but um, better to use the expensive anthracite coal and not uh, make a pain in the neck of yourself to your neighbors, the little old ladies with uh, clotheslines. Uh, even if it cost a little bit more because, you know, it would cost a lot more to get an injunction uh, with a possible jail sentence and, and damages. And uh, the third beneficial effect is you had uh, this uh, concept of, um, uh, what do they call it? Ah, losing my marbles here. Uh, uh, what is it when you, um, uh, well, uh, I'm, the word is uh, missing, but but the, I'll describe it. What what happened was they would uh, get the dust particles off of the um, uh, the, uh, the laundry or um, uh, environmental forensics. That's the word I was looking for. Forensics. You know, uh, uh, we have all these uh, CSI shows on TV, uh, and uh, they have forensics. You know, you have a dead body lying there, and one of the things you ask is the motivation. Another thing you ask is, well, is there semen on this dead body or blood, sp uh, spatch, uh, blood splashes or uh, whatever, uh, fingerprints on, on murder weapons? So you have forensics and environmental forensics is you have this dust particle on the little old lady's um, uh, laundry and we want to find out where did it come from. Or the, the soot got out of the railroad and, you know, you could prove uh, you put it under a microscope, uh, a microscope and you look at the other stuff that the factory or the railroad is doing. And, and if it matches, then, well, then uh, you didn't have much environmental forensics. It was only the mid-19th century, but uh, it was moved in this direction. And uh, I won't say again that this was a perfect solution, but it was a pretty good solution, as good as um, justice could bring about. Okay, the next chapter in this little story uh, was the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, 1910s, 1920s, uh, the so-called progressive period. And during the progressive period, uh, the U.S. wanted to become number one. Who was the number one power in the, uh, the world then? It was uh, Great Britain. And uh, how do you get to be the number one great power? Well, you have to have battleships. You have to have, um, I don't know, tanks or jeeps or, well, in the 1890s, I don't know, airplanes, I forget, I'm a little weak on history. You had to have guns anyway. And uh, so the next time that some little old lady comes to the uh, court and says that their factory is uh, polluting my laundry, uh, the court would have a very, very different attitude uh, than in the 1830s and 1840s. Instead of saying, well, let's see, uh, is there damage? Is there proof? Um, and if so, we'll... Uh, will rule for the plaintiff, and if not, will uh, rule for the defendant. Now the court had something very, very different to say. Now what the court said was, yeah, yeah, they're violating your, I'm putting it in my own terms. I don't know if they had a Brooklyn accent in those days. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're violating your, your private property rights, your stinking, lousy, selfish private property rights, which are not in the, the public good. And what does the public good consist of? Well, the public good consists of U.S. being number one. And how is the U.S. Go going to be number one? Well, they're going to um, have armaments and, and ships and, and battle cruisers and stuff like that. And uh, so we're not going to hassle uh, the factory that, that's making munitions or making uh, steel or whatever it is they're making. Uh, 
we're, you know, we're, we're going to just reject your lawsuit. So tough on you, little old lady. Uh, you know, uh, as Cartman would say, screw you guys, screw you guys, screw you guys, screw you old lady. We're not going to uh, uh, contemplate your um, – uh, your lawsuit. But as a sop to the old lady, what they did is they had minimum smokestack height regulations. So the old smokestack was, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet high. The new one was 200 feet high. I'm not sure if these are the right numbers, but something like that. And now, and uh, now, you know, the poor little old lady, uh, she's being inundated from smoke from 30 miles away because the smokestacks are so high. And, uh, the reason we have the problem of pollution is not because of private property rights and libertarian theory about um, uh, uh, trespass, but because the government uh, is the monopoly power of law and the monopoly uh, power of law refused to uphold the law, uh, the libertarian law against uh, um, uh, trespass because trespass is uh, a violation of rights. So, of course, you get this horrible situation and uh, I was born in 1941, and uh, I remember in the 1950s, uh, there was very heavy um, pollution. I remember in the 1960s and the 70s, I think this is right before the Clean Air Act, I once made a trip to Los Angeles, and, and my eyes started tearing, and I wasn't sad. It was that I wasn't used to the L.A. pollution. I was used to the New York pollution. But there was a lot of pollution. I remember there was a, a cartoon in the uh, New Yorker, well, they had these great cartoons and there was a mother and a daughter eating soup in an outdoor restaurant. And you think the mother would say to the daughter, uh, hurry up, dear, eat your soup before it gets cold. But no, no, <laughs> what she said was, hurry up, dear, eat your soup before it gets dirty. Uh, we, we had some sort of Chinese type situation where people were wearing uh, gas masks or all sorts of uh, protective uh, things. And, you know, it's really very, very bad. And then you had to have the Clean Air Act because uh, the government said, well, the market has failed. Of course the market failed because the market wasn't allowed to work. Now, let me give you one example. Let me see if I can pull this out. I should have been better prepared, but I'm an absent-minded professor, so you have to make allowances for me. Uh, here it is. This comes from my own book, Economics and the Environment, uh, Reconciliation. It was a Fraser Institute book. And I uh, included Murray Rothbard's chapter on air pollution. And here's a quote from it on my page 256. And it says uh, here that the Supreme Court of Georgia, in this case, Holman versus Athens Empire Laundry Company, 1919, during the progressive period, said, pollution of, quote, the pollution of the air so far as is reasonably necessary to the enjoyment of life and indispensable to progress of society is not actionable. Not actionable? Not actionable means that you can pollute somebody <laughs> and, and you can't sue them because actionable means, you know, suing them. It's not actionable. You can't uh, sue the person. So, of course, you're going to have crises. You're going to have all sorts of uh, difficulties um, if, if you can't sue people who trespass. Look, if, if you take uh, garbage, uh, eggshells and lemon peels and coffee grounds and stuff like that, and you dump it on your neighbor's lawn, well, the neighbor's going to call the cops or, well, at first the neighbor, if it's a nice neighbor, is going to say, you know, have you lost your mind? What are you doing? Uh, come back here with a shovel and a broom and get your crap off my lawn. Uh, maybe they think you have Alzheimer's or something. That's if they're nice. And if they're not so nice, they'll just call the cops and say, look, this maniac, my next door neighbor dropped the garbage on me, uh, you know, I want damages on an injunction and, and put this guy in jail if he does it again. Well, that's what an injunction is. Uh, but if you grind it up into fine little bits of uh, uh, minute particles, well, it's the same thing, isn't it? Uh, so there shouldn't be any real difference between dumping garbage on people, macro, macro garbage or micro garbage, uh, small dust particles. Uh, and if the law would have been uh, upheld and, and if we would have had better uh, environmental forensics and no minimum smokestack height regulations, we wouldn't have need any Clean Air Act or any government uh, involvement in, in uh, safeguarding the, the environment because, uh, uh, at least with regard to air pollution, uh, there wouldn't have been any problem. Now, I mean, the environment... Uh, includes more than pollution. I mean, there's species extinction, there's uh, global warming, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I do teach a course on environmental economics at Loyola, 
and I could go on forever, but I've been assigned just pollution. So I'm going to just stick to pollution. And I, I think I'm at 16 minutes now. So I'm going to go in just another few minutes and then maybe we'll have some questions and discussion and dialogue. Uh, let me uh, add one more point, and that is um, uh, this concept of called coming to the nuisance. What is coming to the nuisance? Coming to look. Suppose that the factory were there first. Suppose that the factory were there before the little old lady. I'm, I'm sort of assuming that the, the little old lady was there first, and now the factory came and polluted her. But suppose the opposite. Suppose that the factory were there, and not only was the factory, um, you know. Um, producing steel or iron or whatever it was producing, but as a, as a byproduct, it was sending dust particles, say, one square mile around it. And uh, let, let's say that it had a small smokestack and uh, the winds were such that it only go within one square mile. They could keep their um, pollution or their um, uh, excess dust particles within one square mile. Now, if the little old lady uh, put her house uh, two miles away and then they uh, started uh, more heavily uh, uh, manufacturing and now the smoke hit her, well, then she's in the right and they are trespassers. And, and uh, if I were the judge and, and there was proof of this, I would uh, side on her case. But suppose, she, suppose that the factory only takes a quarter of a mile square. And uh, the, um, the factory owner never homesteads the land surrounding the quarter mile square, the rest of it, the three quarter mile. Uh, and now the little old lady builds her house a half mile away from the, um, the factory such that it's her land, but uh, the smoke has been there before she came. So in law, it's called coming to the nuisance. Now, uh, it's a very different kind of case. Now, I would say, if I were the libertarian judge, I would say, well, you know, lady, it's tough. Uh, they were there first. They homesteaded the right to uh, pollute within one square mile. And uh, you come in a uh, half mile away. Well, what do you expect? What do you expect them to shut down? They were there first. And according to libertarian homesteading theory, uh, the people who were there first have the rights. And uh, the people who uh, come to the nuisance um, uh, are sort of out of luck. It's too bad on them. And, and similarly with, the, you know, if the railroad was there first and then the farmer came, too bad on the farmer. Um, uh, there's this guy, Ronald Coase, C-O-A-S-E, who wrote a, an article, I forget what it was called, something like Social Costs in 1960. This is the most heavily cited article in all of economics. Uh, Ronald Coase later won the Nobel Prize in economics. Ronald Coase, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, pretty much started the lawn economics movement, which is now a subset of economics like uh, micro and macro and labor and international. Lawn economics is a subset of economics, one of the sub-disciplines. And uh, Ronald Coase has a very different view, uh, I, I would say a non-libertarian view. And um, I don't know if I want to go into it now. Maybe we can discuss that during the question period. Uh, but the, uh, uh, another example of this coming to the nuisance is an airport. The airport doesn't usually uh, have much uh, pollutants, but it has noise, and noise pollution is the same economically as um, dust particle pollution. And if the uh, airport uh, has a square mile of uh, runways and then uh, 10 square miles of noise, uh, and they were there first, well, then they have a right to, um, to make noise. And uh, if you locate within the 10 square mile area, you can't tell them to shut down. On the other hand, if they're using... Um, jet plane or propeller planes and all of a sudden they use jet planes and you were outside the 10 mile limit well then uh, 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 you would have a case not them okay well I, I've gone on for about 20 minutes and that's roughly what I thought I would do I hope I've introduced the subject and uh, now uh, we can have questions discussions disagreements uh, you know we can learn from each other we can uh, try to uh, fine tune or better hone this uh, uh, libertarian theory of property rights and pollution. Thank you, Walter. All right, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask them in text or to the right in the questions tab. Or if you'd like to ask on screen, you can click video chatting in the upper right and then click start your webcam and I'll be able to drag you on screen. Uh, Joe Kent asks, can a beautiful view be homesteaded? Ah, that, that's a good one. That, that's a very, very important question. And I would say no. 
you, you can't homestead views because if you homesteaded views, you would have overdetermination. You would have a, a clash of property rights. And, and there's one thing that uh, libertarians can't abide, and that is clashes of rights. We don't believe that rights can conflict and that you have to have some sort of balancing uh, thing. That, that's for the mainstream. We libertarians think that if there's a seeming clash, well, then one or both of the rights have been misspecified. Now, look, if you could homestead a view, uh, right now I'm, uh, I'm seeing Matt. And I don't like the way Matt parts his hair. And by the way, he's got too much hair. <laughs> he should be balder. And uh, if I could homestead the view, I could say, you know, Matt is violating my rights because look at all the hair he's got. And, and I'm follically challenged and he's not. And, and I, he doesn't even have a part in his hair. I've got a big part, you know. Uh, the whole thing is a part. Um, uh, but then, so if I own a view and, and I could say, I don't like the way Matt looks and Matt could say, well, look, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> tough on you. I'm going to wear my hair the way I want. Uh, then we would have a conflict in rights. My right to a view of Matt would conflict with his right to, you know, wear the T-shirt he's wearing or to have his hairstyle that way. And, and I don't like the cut of his glasses either. <laughs> I, I hope you don't mind. I'm j just sort of teasing. Uh, another uh, point would be, uh, uh, suppose I like my house colored uh, gray, the exterior gray, but somebody doesn't like it. And uh, he says, well, he, the view is horrible. And, and I said, well, I have a right to paint my house whatever color I want. Uh, you do get into problems sometimes, like if the hippies move in next door and they paint their house pink and blue and green and, um, I don't know, uh, tangerine color, and it lowers the property values. Uh, you might have a, a conflict there. But the way to get around that, it's sort of internalizing the externalities, to use a little economic jargon. Uh, what you do is you get a condominium association where you all sort of agree that the, the exterior color of the house has to be uh, either the same or within certain limits, you know, you can't have uh, rainbow color or whatever. So my my short answer to the to the very important and very good question, uh, can you homestead views is you cannot, because if you could homestead views, then you could tell other people how to uh, dress or how to uh, part their hair or how to color their houses or how to, uh, I don't know, farm, you know, like, uh, suppose I don't like apple trees. I don't like the view of apple trees and you're an apple tree farmer. And I tell you, you know, cut down all the apple trees and make pear trees. And, you know, <laughs> we have a conflict. And uh, the idea of uh, libertarian law is to get rid of conflicts and homesteading a view would be um, uh, uh, creating a conflict unnecessarily. All right. Our next question is from... Uh... Lincoln Gardner, what are your thoughts on the Coase theorem? Oh, evil Coase theorem. Well, you, you see, uh, the Coase theorem, uh, I'm glad you asked me that, and I paid Lincoln five bucks to ask that question because, no, I'm kidding, I, I didn't really, and I don't owe you five bucks, Lincoln, sorry. Uh, let's get back to this little old lady who comes in and says, well, that there factory is uh, polluting me and um, uh, creating a lot of damage, and I want you to stop. Uh, how would Coase, if uh, Coase were the judge, or if there were a Coasean judge, how would he answer the question? What, the, way he would, the way he would answer the question is he wouldn't look backward. See, I'm, I'm looking backward. I'm saying, well, how much damage was there? And, you know, let the, uh, the factory pay for it. Uh, what they would do is they would look forward. They would say, well, uh, if the cost of uh, stopping the, uh, the pollution is $100 and the... Um, the benefit to the little old lady is only $20, well, then uh, we're not going to uh, allow the, the lawsuit. Uh, namely, Coase is, is not going to uh, uphold property rights. Uh, Coase has got this thing that uh, the purpose of law is to uh, produce wealth or to maximize wealth. And if it would cost $100 to put in a smoke prevention device and the benefits would only be $20, uh, society would lose $80 and Coase would say, well, you know, we're going to run roughshod over the rights of the, the little old lady, which doesn't seem to be very just to me. Uh, I have uh, many, many articles attacking Coase, uh, maybe 10 or 15, couldn't be that many, maybe 10. And if you're really interested in that, email me. I'm at wblock, W-B-L-O-C-K, at Loino, L-O-Y-N-O, Lewis Oliver Yellow New Orleans dot E-D-U. And I will send you more critiques of Coast than, than you want to read. 
Um, one of my reductios ad absurdum of him is, uh, let's say I rape a woman and the police capture me and, uh, and they're about to throw me in jail. And I said, no, no, I want a Kosian judge. And uh, I got a Kosian judge and I told the judge, look, you know, I was uh, at sea and uh, for a year and I, I really uh, valued uh, having intercourse with this woman. And, and my value that I placed on it was uh, oh a thousand dollars. And she's a prostitute and uh, she only charges a hundred. So therefore, if I rape her, uh, society gains nine hundred, namely the difference between a thousand and a hundred. And I could get away with rape. I mean, that's despicable. That, that's disgusting. I mean, that's horrible. Now, I know the New York Times is going to say that I favor rape, but I don't really favor rape. What I'm saying is that if we uh, uh, take this case and we uh, use the Kosian analysis, uh, you can uh, support rape, which is uh, a despicable horror. So I'm very much against Kos. I, I think uh, that Kos has led us down uh, the garden path. Uh, he's led uh, uh, thousands of economists down the garden path into this um, a crazy view about law because, um, uh, you know, let me give you another example. Um, I, I now uh, grab um, Matt's wallet. I'm grabbing his wallet. And it's got a picture of his mother, his father. It's got his license. It's got his pictures and all that. And it's got, you know, uh, 200 bucks in it or whatever it is. And Matt grabs me and, and mar Frog marches me into the court and says, Block just stole my wallet. And, and we have a Kosian judge. <clears throat> and the and the Kosian judge says, well, he doesn't ask about the past. He doesn't say, Block, where did you get the wallet? And the true Alma be true false. I got it right out of Matt's pocket. He doesn't ask that. What he says is, Block, what will you do with the contents of the wallet? And I say, oh, I'll write great poetry. I'll, I'll do great things. And then he says to Matt, well, what will you do with the contents of the wallet? And he says, well, I'm a drunkard. I'll just, uh, you know, go out and buy some booze and I'll lie in the gutter drunk. And then uh, Co says, well, you know, we should give the wallet to Block because wealth will be maximized if Block has the wallet rather than if, if um, Matt uh, has the wallet. You know, <laughs> if this isn't a violation of libertarian principle, then nothing is. And namely, Coase is the Antichrist or, I don't know, uh, Lucifer, uh, the devil. Uh, I mean, he's a nice guy, uh, uh, personally, I guess. I, I once met him. He seemed nice. But his theories are, are just uh, horrible. And they've taken over the entire economics profession. As I said, that this article was the most highly cited article of all articles, I think, in social science, not just the economics. And and uh, academics and scholars and intellectuals put great weight on not how many publications you have, but how many citations you have. And this is the most heavily cited article, and it's just pure crap. So uh, we have to uh, watch out for uh, evil Ronald Coase. And, and, the, and the drunkard Matt, watch out for him too. You, you never know what, else. Matt, you don't mind me uh, picking on you, I'm sure. No, First no. First I, I criticize your hairstyle, and I call you a drunkard. It's all in good fun. Uh, you've called me a socialist before too, so it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Matt Hasty asks, uh, people from the city move out to the waterfront lands and then complain about the noise airboats make. Is this a case of moving to the nuisance? It depends upon uh, who was there first. If the airboats were there first, well, then they have a right to do it, and if not, not. The The book that I'm now working on is um, uh, privatizing lakes, rivers, oceans, aquifers, bodies of water. Uh, I forget the title of it, something like privatizing water. Well, it depends upon who owns the lake uh, and, and what the lake owner wants. I mean, uh, so here the, the, uh, the homes, uh, let's suppose that the um, uh, owner of the lake homesteaded the lake first. And let's suppose that uh, there were no, well, you know, I, I, I'm rethinking this uh, because if, you see, if the lake owns the, um, the lake owner owns the land on the side, let me start again. <laughs> Excuse me. If uh, there were only sailboats, quiet sailboats and um, what do you call it? Um, uh, swimmers, uh, quiet swimmers, uh, you know, and uh, there were uh, uh, houses around the lake. And now uh, the lake owner owns the lake and he's contemplating putting in uh, uh, noisy um, uh, motorboats. Well, it depends upon who was there first. If the homeowners were there first 
and they don't want the the noise, well, then you, the owner can't have noise. Uh, just like, um, you know, if you and I are neighbors and, and we have quiet and all of a sudden I'm thinking of starting a, uh, you know, in New Orleans where I am now, we have jazz and, and we have very loud jazz and it's a quiet neighborhood. And, and you know, at, at 10 o'clock, everyone goes to sleep. And all of a sudden at three in the morning, I've got loud jazz near you. If you were there first, I have no right to make noise against you. Uh, very similar to the airplane uh, question. So, uh, uh, the question of who owns the lake is sort of uh, uh, peripheral to this question. I, I guess I got into that because I'm writing this book. And, you know, uh, what do they say? If um, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the midst of working on this Oceans, Rivers, and Lakes book. So I got sidetracked. Uh, I, I, I think we don't need to bring in uh, ownership of the lake, although that's always fun. All right, uh, the next question is from uh, Daniel Shafrir. Uh, one second, this one's two parts. I've got to scroll down and get the first. Okay. Uh, given that car pollution is an invasion of property rights, and given that it's only allowed if I've homesteaded the easement to pollute by having the road first, does that mean that in an ANCAP society, no new roads can be built because all the newcomers would be violating the non-aggression principle? That's, boy, you got some nasty people <laughs> in your list here. That's a very, very uh, important, very uh, crucial question. Nasty, but nice. Uh, good, good question. Uh, let me answer this a little circuitously. I'm a professor. I'm not supposed to answer questions directly. I'm supposed to go around and, and stuff. Uh, I'm going to put another question in this person's mouth, and then I'll talk about roads. And by the way, I do have another book on why we should privatize roads, so this is relevant to that. One objection to the Rothbardian thesis that if you don't like the polluter, sue him, is well, what about cars? Each car uh, contributes, you know, this much pollution, very, very little. Uh, but there are millions of cars, and together they really create a, a, a gigantic problem. And what are you going to do? Sue each car owner for pollution, and and he'll defend himself by saying de minimis. He'll say, yes, yes, I polluted a little bit, but you know, my little bit didn't do much. So get off my case. And Murray's answer to this is, you don't sue. The car owner, you don't sue the motorist, you sue the highway owner. You sue the highway owner because he's got like a body house of pollution. Uh, he's got tens of thousands of cars and, and 10,000 cars or 100,000 cars together, no longer de minimis. Now it's a serious problem. So you sue him or you threaten to sue him. And then what he does is he turns around and says, okay, everybody uh, get a catalytic uh, converter. Or if you get a catalytic converter, um, I'll charge you very little. And if you don't, if you want one of those smoke uh, cars, I'm going to charge you a lot more. And because two or three cars like that aren't going to create a problem. It's when you get tens of thousands like that. By the way, in the early uh, uh, private highways, private roads, what they did is they charged based on the width of the wagon wheel. If the wagon wheel was very thin, think ice skate, it would put ruts in the road and they would charge you more. Whereas if the wagon wheel was wide, <clears throat> think steamroller would flatten out the ruts in the road and the roads were uh, uh, dirt roads. So you needed to flatten it out. So the market uh, works beautifully. The magic of the market is Ronald Reagan would say. Uh, so the answer to that question is sue the, um, uh, the road owner. Don't sue the motorist. Okay. Now to get back to the question uh, that was asked, well, I want to set up a new road. Well, how do I set up a new road? Well, I want to go from um, – uh, where are you, Matt? Where, physically, where are you now, right, right now? What's – North Carolina. Okay, I want to set up a road from me to Matt so I can visit him and we can discuss uh, easier. And I'm in New Orleans, and I don't know how far it is to, from here to North Carolina, say 700 miles. I'm just picking out a number. And I don't know how many people own land between here and North Carolina. Uh 10,000 people, let's say. I don't know. It's mostly farmland, so there could, it couldn't be millions, but 10,000 people. And uh, this leads me into a problem of, you know, do we need, um, what do you call it, eminent domain? Do we need the government to uh, help me uh, buy land from people? 
Uh, and I would say no, because eminent domain is certainly a little bit incompatible with libertarianism is you're stealing people's land. Uh, so what we would do is um, I would uh, say, OK, well, there are many ways to make the road. I can make it directly as the crow flies, you know, a, a, a direct road from me to North Carolina. Or I could go a little circuitously. I could go around this way, around that way, uh, sort of think like a football, uh, the way a football is shaped. Uh, you know, the road, uh, I could go 10 miles here, 10 miles there. And what I could do is I could uh, buy, uh, what do you call it? Options, options to buy land. So I go to Farmer Jones and I say, hey, Farmer Jones, I'm thinking of putting a road right through your land. Uh, will you sell me some land? And he says, oh, sure. It's, you know, 10,000 an acre. And I said, well, I'm not really sure I want to buy it. It all depends upon whether I can get other people to sell me their land uh, in uh, on, on route. But I'd like to buy an option to buy a land. So you, you're willing to sell me this land for 10000 an acre? Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you uh, 1000 just 1000 for these uh, 10 acres, which are, cost $100,000, uh, uh, an option. Namely, uh, within a year or two, I can exercise this option to buy the land at the price we've agreed to. And then if I can buy options all the way through, then I, uh, then I uh, have a, a route. Okay, but now the pollution is going to, See, how, how wide does the road have to be? Well, if it's going to be three lanes this way and three lanes that way, and each lane is 10 feet wide, I guess, something like that, and um, I'm going to have a, a, what do you call it, a, a grass in between. Uh, what do you call that? I forget. Uh, let's say it's going to be 30 feet. So I need 90 feet. Let's say I need 100 feet wide. But the pollution on this road is going to seep out a little bit so let's say instead of 100 feet, it'll be 200 feet wide. Okay, well, then I have to buy 200 feet wide. And uh, I'm going to have um, uh, electric cars on my road. I'm going to have uh, catalytic converters. I'm going to make a rule that if you use um, a lead a gasoline, I'm going to charge you an arm and a leg. You can still use it, but I'm going to charge you more. Whereas if you use um, a better fuel that doesn't create uh, pollution, I'll charge you less. So I, uh, instead of having to buy 100 feet wide, I have to buy 200 feet wide. And that would be the answer to the question. All right, our next question is from Joe Kent. Um, in Hawaii, we have a problem with plastic shopping bags flying into the ocean, and they've now banned plastic bags on the islands. Libertarian solution? You know, this is interesting. Uh, the, the New York Times just had a thing saying um, uh, we should charge a 10%, 10 cent tax on, uh, or 10 cents more for every plastic bag. Uh, I think in their heart of hearts, they wanted to ban it, but uh, there was a bill in the New York Senate or something saying, well, let's, um, you know, uh, add on 10 cents for each plastic bag. And uh, the New York Times applauded this. And I wrote an article saying, wait a second, they think that demand curves slope downwards. They think that if you charge 10 cents more for a plastic bag than, than, than uh, giving them away for free, people will want them less. Well, why don't they apply that to minimum wage law? <laughs> uh, because <clears throat> they also favor the minimum wage law. And there they, they deny that down, uh, downward sloping demand curve. See how I get off the top? The, the, you got to keep me uh, uh, closer on to, on to the topic. Okay. Uh, so instead of uh, charging a tax on them, they're going to ban them. Well, the libertarian wears eyeglasses. And what are the libertarian eyeglasses? The libertarian eyeglasses are the non-aggression principle. And we look at everything through these libertarian non-aggression principle eyeglasses, and we say, well, is X per se a violation of the non-aggression principle? In which case, let's ban it. And if not, let's not ban it. So is murder a, viola a per se violation of the non-aggression principle? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we got to ban murder. How about uh, slavery? Yeah, ban slavery. How about rape? How about theft? How about arson? Kidnap? Yes, yes, yes. These are all per se evil things that violate rights. Well, now I, I have a plastic bag. Here's a plastic bag. Ooh, plastic bag. Wait, I got to see. I got cough drops in the plastic bag. Did I violate anyone's rights? Is this a per se violation of the non-aggression principle? Of course not. So we would be against banning plastic bags. Now, uh, putting plastic bags into the ocean, well, now <clears throat> we bring in ownership of the ocean. And I own the ocean <clears throat> around the... Um, let me get a drink of water. I'm running dry here. <clears throat> I own the ocean around Hawaii, 
let's say, and uh, I don't like plastic bags in the ocean, and I have a rule that anyone puts a plastic bag in the ocean, I'm going to charge them $10,000. Is that compatible with libertarianism? Oh, yeah, that's compatible with libertarianism. So the idea here is uh, banning plastic bags is no good uh, because – Owning a plastic bag is, is not a violation of rights. And by the way, you know, when you go to the hospital uh, and they put some sort of drip into your arm, uh, you know, because you had an operation, well, saline solution or whatever they put in there, sugar water, I'm not sure how they feed you, when, you know, sort of stick something in your blood and they feed you that way. Well, guess what? Guess what holds the solution or the blood, the plasma that they put in your body? Plastic bag, anyone? So what are you going to do, ban plastic bags in Hawaii and people are going to die because they can't get um, transfusions of blood? I mean, you know, that's crazy. Now, what are they going to do with those plastic bags after they finish with this patient? They don't want to mix the blood because, you know, catch HIV or something. Well, you got to be careful what you do with the plastic bag, but merely owning a plastic bag is crazy. Oh, I see. The thing says plastic shopping bags, and I'm talking about plastic bags that are in hospitals. But it's the same thing. Uh, the key is not so much uh, the plastic bag, whether shopping bag or hospital bag. It's what you do with it, how you dispose of it. And if you dispose of it on other people's property, you're trespassing. And you should be uh, stopped by, uh, you know, they should go to court and say, hey, um, Matt is now a, a dropper of plastic bags. I'm blaming you on everything. I might as well blame you for this. Matt just tossed a plastic bag in the ocean. Let's go sue his ass off and, you know, uh, get an injunction and damages. And, you know, the plastic bags are no good for the fish. And we want to keep the fish going. And then Matt's just a horrible person because he's spewing forth plastic bags all over the place. So the key is to ban not spewing, <clears throat> not plastic bags, but ban ban trespassing plastic bags onto other people's property. If you want to keep the plastic bags on your own property, that's fine. I'm uh, it's my position of power and influence here to uh, sneak in one of my own questions. Um, about a year ago, there was a case libertarians got worked up over where someone was fined for collecting rainwater on their property because it prevented the rainwater from flowing down to the neighbor's irrigation pond. Now, is that a state of the, a case of the state violating his right to rain falling on his property or a case of the state protecting the neighbor's easement to the flow of water? Well, my view is homesteading is based on first come, first serve. Uh, suppose I uh, clear some trees and clear some rocks and I put in a, uh, some corn and, and now I'm growing the corn. And I was there first. Now you, Matt, you come along and, and start knocking down my corn plants and putting in something else, um, pear trees. Well, you're violating my property rights because homesteading is based on the first one there gets it. Uh, the first one to use it uh, has the right to it. I mean, if the second guy has a, a better right than the first guy, well, then the third guy has a better right than the second guy at, and so on ad infinitum. And we never have secure property rights because the last guy, the Johnny come lately can say, well, I'm the 17th guy here, but my uh, claim to the land is better than anyone else because I'm the last one. Of course, the 18th guy right behind him is going to take it from him. So we would have no property rights. No, no, no. It's the first guy uh, is the one who who has the right. So if the rainwater falls on your roof and you put a big uh, cup on top of your roof or a big whatever it is to capture the water, too bad on your neighbor that doesn't get the water that would otherwise fall. Let him put something on top of his house so he can collect his own rainwater. Well, say I own some, uh, some property, I've homestead some property on a river and I've set up a water wheel that's you know doing what water wheels do. Can someone upriver then, because the water gets to them first, uh, dam up the river? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, this book I'm doing, we, we're privatizing rivers, uh, oceans, lakes. Uh, I have a co-author, and he and I are hassling over this very question. My answer to this, he's wrong, uh, and we're going to have a special chapter where we debate this uh, because we couldn't agree, and we agree on everything else. So instead of breaking it up, we're going to, you know, just have a chapter where we debate this. My side of this, the correct side, is uh, it depends who was there first. If your water wheel was there first uh, and you're downstream, let's say, and, and now this guy comes up and diverts the water uh, somewhere else to his field so that the, your water wheel doesn't work, well, too bad on him. On the other hand, if he was diverting water first, 
uh, and your water wheel doesn't work when you know you don't have enough water pressure, well, too bad on you. So again, I return to homesteading uh, goes to the first first come first serve. The the first guy that homesteads the the property is the legitimate owner of it, and uh, this would work with water, it would work with land, it would work with um, pollution, it would work with anything. Uh, I mean, once we have a principle, we got to stick to it. Uh, and homesteading says first come first serve, so I think we should stick with that unless you know we can come up with a better theory. And I don't think that the the last guy has has a right is a great theory because then. Uh, you know, there's always a next guy and, and uh, we could never have any security and property rights. Look, the reason we own ourselves, the reason I own this body and you own that body is I homesteaded this one and you homesteaded that one. And, uh, you know, if I hug you, I come and grab you and I say, well, now I own you. No, no, no. You, you homesteaded yourself first and vice versa. If you hug me and say, well, now you're my property, you're my slave, you know, nonsense to that. Uh, we homestead ourselves. We uh, have a will, we direct our hands, we direct our mouths, whatever. We, in a sense, mix our labor with ourselves, if I can be poetic about this. That's why we own ourselves. And, and I don't own you and you don't own me. And we don't own half of the two of us or anything like that. You own you, I own me because of homesteading. And homesteading is the first guy that gets there is the owner of it. Well, now, wouldn't that change your answer on the uh, on the rainwater question? Wouldn't it that make it uh, so if the guy who was getting the water for his irrigation pond had been there before the guy who was collecting the water? Yes, no, no, you're right. I missed that part. I didn't realize that the uh, the guy who was getting uh, collecting rainwater was there first, and now you, you dirty rat, put this thing on your roof collecting his water. You're the bad guy. Notice you always come out to be the bad guy, no matter what happens. Uh, no, I missed that. I, I didn't realize that um, uh, the guy who wanted the water for his pond was there first. I, 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 I didn't realize that. Now that I realize um, it, I, I, I think I'm being consistent with my principles. I think so, too. Um, Brad Moore uh, asks a related question. How viable do you think the idea of privatizing waterways would be in terms of finding fault against aggressors? Well, that's a two-part question. Uh, first of all, how viable do you think uh, the idea of privatizing water is, period? And the answer is not very viable at all. What are you, crazy? <laughs> I mean, uh, my book on privatizing roads and highways was crazy because, you know, what's the likelihood of us privatizing roads and highways? Only a bunch of weird libertarians like us even think about that. Uh, for the average guy, you know, uh, the government has to own the roads. And for the average guy, uh, the government, uh, either no one or the government has to own the oceans and the rivers. The Mississippi River owned by Mississippi River Corporation. You know, what controlled substances are you imbibing? You know, uh, we're not going to let you drive because you're drunk or drugged or something. So I think it's not very viable. But uh, we libertarians are not that practical. We're out after the truth. And uh, the truth is that uh, the best system is to privatize highways. It'll save, oh, uh, 25,000 deaths every year on the socialist highways of people dying like flies. And I think it would also uh, do much better uh, with water. A private enterprise is better than government ownership or non-ownership, and it, it applies to everything. Uh, my motto in my emails is if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything including water and, and, and land and every Look, the, the GDP on the water is about 1% or 2% or 5% of the world GDP, whereas the water is about 75% of the Earth's surface. So we're not getting our money's worth out of water. We're getting water shortages and we're getting all sorts of problems with water. Um, uh, so I think we should privatize it. Uh, could you put that thing back on the screen? Because I forgot what the second part of that question was. The first part was, is it viable? Oh, in, in terms of finding fault against aggressors, I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, Brad, could you elaborate or explain that? I, I think he's saying, like, uh, as in terms of someone upriver polluting you, is it oh, practical to be able to figure out who? Well, I don't think it's very viable because uh, we no longer have the uh, property rights law of the, the 19th century. We now have property rights law of the 20th and 21st centuries where where you, where you, things are not actionable. So uh, I think that if um, 
first of all, I don't think the Mississippi River is ever going to be, well, I shouldn't say ever, but not likely under Obama and not likely under uh, whoever uh, succeeds Obama. And unless it's, I don't know, Rand Paul, maybe he turned libertarian. Maybe he'll do it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that would be a stretch. Even Ron Paul would be a stretch for Ron Paul to um, privatize the Mississippi and, and, and the oceans. Uh, but if we could privatize it, then I think that uh, we could find fault against aggressors. Uh, it's just trespass. And whether you trespass smoke particles or dust or uh, sparks or whatever, or put crap into the Mississippi River that screws up the fish and makes it undrinkable or whatever. Uh, in, in any case, uh, I think uh, uh, it's feasible that it could be done and it would be done if we had a libertarian society. And we should have a libertarian society. <laughs> Uh, Contessa asks, and I think she's referring to uh, your uh, when you were talking about uh, um, putting together a road and you know getting options and stuff. Is it helpful to contract with a third party when searching for property and require them to find your must-haves and must-not-haves? I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. I, right. I, I don't. Contessa, could you try again, uh, maybe elaborate or ask a different question? Because I'm not connecting, and I don't like to answer questions that I don't understand. We'll move to the next one. We'll come back to it. Contessa, uh, try again. Herman Morris asks, how does one homestead bodies of water? By mixing one's labor with it, just like anything else. Uh, so, for example, who should get to own the Mississippi River? Well... Um, the people who have land on the side of the Mississippi River, uh, on the east side and the west side, on the ground that, you know, they probably uh, use the water. The people who have those boats that go up and down the Mississippi River uh, that carry uh, cargo. And then there are uh, cruises, uh, 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 people who fish in there, people who swim in there. Uh, what proportion? Well, the, the, this is the problem that the Soviets faced when they got rid of communism. Who should own the uh, the collectivized farm? Who should own the uh, the factory that makes I don't know um, uh, the shoes? Well, uh, the libertarian answer is uh, the people who mix their labor with it. So the people who, uh, well, in in the Soviet case, the the people who whose money was stolen from them in order to make those um, uh, factories. But if you can't find them, then the people who work there. Uh, they would have mixed their labor with the farm or with the factory, and they should be the owner of it. And then they should be able to sell it, and it should be listed on a stock exchange. Margaret Thatcher, uh, when she privatized the public housing, what she said is that uh, I think all the people who lived in public houses, uh, public housing, I think they call it council houses in, in England, uh, they can either buy it for free or not buy it for free. They can either have it or buy it for, you know, five bucks or something like that. A better idea would be uh, to find out whose taxes went into that. But if somehow you rule that out, or you can't find them or you take the second best case, the people who live there. And the reason public housing is so crappy is because the people don't own it. And and uh, the people who do own it, namely the government, that has no incentive to make sure like a landlord, a private landlord, to make sure the tenants behave. So public housing falls apart. So the way to privatize that is to give it to and not, not let them buy it, but give it to um, the uh, people who've been using it. So with the Mississippi River, all these boaters and swimmers and fishermen and other people and uh, the people who own um, land on the side of it uh, should uh, get – in other words, what we should have is a Mississippi River Corporation. And the Mississippi River Corporation should have, oh, I don't know, 10 million shares, and it should be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And who should get how many shares? Well, we should div divvy up the shares in proportion to how much you've been using the Mississippi River in the last, oh, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 years. You see, you're not going to get any perfection. It's sort of like trying to unscramble the egg. You really can't do it. You can only sort of approximate things. In British Columbia, Canada, there was this thing called BRIC, British... Uh, Columbia Resource Investment Corporation. The left-wing government had a whole bunch of, oh, I don't know, uh, forests and lumber mills and factories and this and that and the other, and they were going to privatize it. And what they did is they made a company called Brick, and they gave five shares to every uh, British Columbian. Well, you know, it's not a perfect way of doing it, but the, the key is to get it in the private hands.
And then the lefties were saying, well, the stock price went down. This shows privatization is no good. It doesn't show anything of the sort. Prices go up and down. So um, how do you homestead bodies of water the same way you homestead anything else? Mix your labor with it. All right, Joe Kent asks, what are some of the worst examples of government polluting? Hiroshima bomb, the Nagasaki bomb, the atom bomb, that was that was a bad, bad uh, pollution. Uh, killed a lot of people. Uh, boy, that was pretty, pretty grim. I mean, dropping an atom bomb on innocent people. Wow. That I mean, that's disgusting. Uh, but I don't think uh, Joe meant that, although, you know, that, you know, I'm free associating here. Uh, give me a break. Uh, what do I know? Um uh, th that's bad pollution. And then Agent Orange in Vietnam, uh, you know, th that was bad stuff too. And then, you know, uh, uh, government buses and government trucks and government uh, uh, works, uh, you know, they're, they're the worst polluters and uh, somehow uh, we don't get them. Uh, government is evil and, and government pollution is evil. All right, our next question is uh, from Kavi Williams. Could livestock or pets cause their owner to be held liable for the animal's pollution on someone else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you walk your dog, you should have a plastic bag. Plastic bag, anyone? You should have a plastic bag because, you know, your dog is going to do his business on somebody's property or, or well, uh, either a, a lawn or a, a roadway. And, you know, it's sort of yucky to step in and the dog business after you leave you you dog owner so i think you should have yes and and it, it, uh you should be liable for the animal's pollution and, and if your dog bites someone you should be liable for that too uh, it's a different kind of pollution biting but forget about biting it wasn't asked but you know the dog leaves a, a little package on someone's lawn and uh, the, the the homeowner comes out and says oh oh this is great uh, no, the, the dog owner should pick it up. And if the dog owner doesn't pick it up, uh, the dog owner should be uh, arrested for um, pollution or trespass. Uh, with regards to the question of governments polluting, uh, some people in the comments had some, uh, some examples. The Iraq oil fires, Chernobyl, and landmines. I thought landmines was a great one. Oh, oh I, I missed that. Uh, landmines are a great a great example of this. Uh, I, I said I'd give you an hour, and we started at my time three. It's now about two more minutes, so maybe we should uh, wrap up or get one more question in, whatever you think. Uh, let me uh, – we're actually out of questions unless uh, Contessa clarifies, uh, but I've got one more. Um, now – I was uh, I was sad that uh, you had to miss the Austrian Economics Research Conference this year, uh, but at the conference, Ed Dolan pre presented a paper uh, on environmental economics in which he criticized the approaches of Rothbard and Cordato because they placed the onus of enforcement on the person whose rights have been violated, uh, thereby causing the relatively stronger burden to fall on the person whose rights need to be enforced rather than the person who's violating rights. Uh, now, Roy told me that he's writing a rejoin, rejoinder to the paper that's going to come out in, in the same issue of the, uh, I guess, the QJAE. But I wondered what your thoughts on that were. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I asked Timothy uh, why he asked me. Why didn't he ask Cordato? And, and uh, there was another guy uh, who was criticized. And he said, uh, well, Cordato said that he's too busy to write. So I guess I was second choice. And uh, then uh, what happened was um, uh, uh, Dolan's piece was only 7,000 words. And I wrote a reply of 9,000 words because, you know, sometimes it takes more effort to undermine a uh, fallacy than to, to create fallacy. So I have a blistering, blistering attack on Dolan. I think he's just uh, horrible. Uh, not as bad as the government, but, you know, uh, intellectually uh, uh, very indefensible. So I'm not going to, you know, read my paper, uh, but um, my article is scheduled to come out in the same issue, uh, I guess, with Cordato and Dolan, uh, if they accept it, because they might not accept it, because uh, maybe it's too long. I think they only wanted 4,000 words out of me, but I couldn't stop. I mean, I had to get them, because that was an evil, <laughs> uh, mis mischievous, um, ignorant. Uh, I mean, he doesn't even distinguish between and Austrianism. I mean, 
it was really pathetic. Uh, and then I asked him, well, why do you put such a crappy piece of paper uh, paper in, in the QJ? And he said correctly, uh, Murray Rothbard once said, Murray was the original editor of um, the Review of Austrian Economics, which then became QJAE. And Murray's view was sometimes it's good to have a bad article in there as long as you get other people who, you know, make sense of, of that issue. So um, we're, we're out of time now, but let me just say that uh, if my article doesn't appear in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, I will publish it somewhere else, and uh, I will uh, get Dolan on, on that uh, issue. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for coming to speak to us. Uh, we'd love to have you back uh, anytime you want to come. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight and, uh, or this afternoon. And uh, take care. Try to part your hair a little differently. <laughs> I will. I will work on that. Take care. Okay. Thanks. It's always uh, fun.